Okay, this little mini lecture is just to kind of give you an overview of the use of viruses. Um, we're going to talk about gene therapy, uh, the use of viruses to treat cancer, use of viruses in place of antibiotics, phage therapy, and um, how sometimes we make recombinant vaccines um, with viruses. So gene therapy, the idea of gene therapy is to replace a missing or mutated gene. So the concept is someone has a uh, disease based on a change in genetic sequence and can we give them a normal or what we call in genetics wild type copy of the gene so that we can restore normal function. Um, the biggest challenge is how do you get this genetic information into the cells or the tissue that you want? So the biggest challenge for gene therapy is specific delivery of genetic material. Well, now that you have learned uh, a lot about viruses, you know that basically a virus is a vector or a means of getting genetic material to a cell. That's kind of the whole point of a virus is they infect a cell, they deliver genetic material, basically tell the cell to start making more virus. So viruses have been um, a huge uh, component of gene therapy. Um, this is the latest on gene therapy clinical trials. So you can see lots of different viruses being used. Um, adeno or adenovirus, retroviruses, um, lentiviruses like HIV, adeno-associated viruses, which we're going to talk about um, in a second. Vaccinia. Vaccinia is the virus uh, that we use for, or we used to use for a smallpox vaccine. Um, other pox viruses, herpes viruses, um, things like that. So lots of viruses used as a vector, and vector just means a means of delivery um, to, for gene therapy. And so I d made this table to kind of give you an idea of the advantages, disadvantages of different viral vectors. So adeno or adenovirus, however you want to pronounce it, um, is a virus that a lot of us have come in contact with. It can cause um, kind of a cold, um, vex, um, upper respiratory throat kind of um, uh, infection. The big advantages of this type of virus is that you can, oops, sorry, easily manipulate the capsid. So you can adenovirus, I have a picture of it, but it has these big spikes. And the spikes, it's a non-envelope virus. The spikes are what interacts with the cell receptors. So you can actually modify these fairly easily, and that allows targeting, right? And that's the whole point here is we want to be able to target. You don't want your uh, gene therapy to have to go to every single cell. You would dilute out the virus too much. You want to be able to target it to specific cells. Um, it can infect dividing and non-dividing cells. Um, this is important just based on the type of cell you're trying to um, target. Is it um, non-dividing like a neuron? Is it dividing like a skin or epithelial cell? And it has a very large capacity. So genes, human genes, come in various sizes from a few hundred um, base pairs to thousands and thousands of base pairs. And so you'll see that the capacity of what transgene these viruses can carry really varies among these different viruses. 
and you probably make sense to you now that you've started to look at viruses and look at different sizes of genomes. They really vary. Um, so lots of advantages for um, adenovirus. Some disadvantages is that it's short-term or transient expression. So for gene therapy, you would love to give one dose and have it stay in the cells for the life of the patient. Um, this doesn't happen with adenovirus um, because it doesn't integrate, it doesn't stay even as an episome, which is like a, a plasmid in a human cell. Um, so you might have to have repeated uh, therapy or injections of this virus. Um, there's also an issue with immune response. Um, because most people have been infected by adenovirus, um, you may not have changed the capsid outside enough, and so you already have immunity to it. Um, in 1999, there was a um, clinical trial using adenovirus um, as a gene therapy vector, and a young man who was a healthy adult who had volunteered for the, the clinical trial ended up having an um, overreaction by the immune system to the adenovirus vector and um, within four days went into organ failure and died. And they actually stopped all clinical trials for about five years after that incident. So when you're, when you're thinking about gene therapy and viral vectors, you really need to watch out for an immune response um, because you're usually giving very high doses of the virus so that you can get the virus to all the cells you need to. Um, lentiviruses, retroviruses, <clears throat> another popular um, viral vector. Now understand with all of these viruses, um, researchers are taking out the pathogenic genes and they're usually making the viruses um, replication incompetent. So they're really just a delivery um, uh, vector, just a way to get um, DNA to the cells. So you're not giving someone HIV, but you're using parts of the HIV virus to deliver genetic information. Um, so an advantage, you probably know HIV integrates its genetic information into the host chromosome. So this would give you a permanent fix. You're permanently changing that chromosome information. The issue with that is you don't have any control over where it integrates. And so another clinical um, trial for gene therapy, um, four of the 20 children who received a um, lentivirus um, therapy, the virus actually integrated into a spot in the host chromosome that led to cancer, and these children died of cancer. So again, gene therapy studies were halted for a while to um, look more at what can we do with this integration step or do we decide that um, the risk is worth it based on the disease um, the child has. So lentiviruses and retroviruses, um, depending on which one, can infect dividing and non-dividing cells, um, but they have a much smaller genetic capacity than adenovirus. So it all depends on the size of your gene. Um, Adeno-associated virus um, has a lot of advantages. Um, the main one is it does not trigger an immune response, does not cause any known disease. This is actually a defective virus. So this virus cannot replicate on its own. So it's called adeno-associated because it usually has to co-infect with adenovirus in order to make more um, adeno-associated viruses. And you'll see it called AAV. Um, it can infect dividing and non-dividing cells, and sometimes, depending on how we manipulate the genome, it can integrate site-specifically, so we know exactly where it integrates, and we know that doesn't cause any disease. Um, it also, they're making new ones that um, stay as extra chromosomal DNA. So the virus... Um, Sorry, I can't talk and write. Um, so the genetic information that the virus is delivering 
is not going to integrate, but it will stay long term um, in the cells. This is really good for non-dividing cells because you don't lose that extra chromosomal DNA. In dividing cells, a lot of times um, that extra chromosomal DNA will be lost through cell division in some of those cells, so that can be a disadvantage. Um, the other big disadvantage is it has a very small capacity for genetic information. So you have to have small genes that you want to put in there. But AAV is, um, I'll talk about in a minute, a big one for gene therapy right now. Um, so there's also herpes viruses and different types of pox viruses. Um, their biggest uh, advantages is that they can deliver a lot of genetic material, so they have big carrying capacity. Um, they have long-lasting expression, so pox viruses can integrate. Herpes stays as an, um, we call an episome, so circular DNA. Um, they can target different tissues, um, but there is some cytotoxic immune response issues with these types of viruses. One, um, oh, so what are we doing with gene therapy? Um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, cancer diseases. It's not really gene therapy, but we use viruses to target cancer. Um, monogenic diseases are the biggest, uh, easiest goal because they're one gene that we're trying to replace. Um, so with the limited size capacity and how complicated it is, monogenic diseases are a big target for gene therapy. Um, we will also talk a little bit about this, um, infectious diseases using virus vectors, um, and then you can see there's some other um, targets. So I wanted to give you an example of a really cool um, gene therapy that is successful. So it's using adeno-associated virus type 9. Type 9 infects the central nervous system. And SMA is called spinal muscular atrophy. And what happens in this disease is you have a, a mutation in the SMN gene, and it leads to the deterioration of motor neurons. Sorry, I can't spell. Of motor neurons. And the type 1 that they're looking at um, affects children very young, within a couple months of age. So it talks here about early diagnosis is the key um, because you can't replace motor neurons. So you need to keep them healthy from very young. Without this gene therapy, um, many children don't live past a couple years of age. And usually within the first 18 months of, um, or younger, they're on permanent breathing and feeding tubes. So their muscles get so weak, so muscular atrophy, because the motor neurons aren't stimulating the muscles, the muscles become very weak, and so they have trouble swallowing and breathing and moving. So there's a gene therapy trial that was um, uh, just done last year, 2018, um, this little girl has the same disease, but she had gene therapy. She is now a little over three, and she is running around, sitting up. It, it's just kind of miraculous. Um, so they used adeno-associated virus to give her a good copy of the SMN gene. So it targets the motor neurons, it delivers the gene, and that gene seems to stay in those cells. Since they're non-dividing, you don't have to worry about losing that genetic information. The harsh reality of this gene therapy, so she was one of 15 patients in a clinical trial. Um, right now, the price tag is $2 million for the therapy. And 
right now they only have developed or been able to produce a hundred doses. So this is fairly rare, one in six to 10,000 births. Um, so I guess, I, I, don't, I don't know how rare or not that is. So it affects enough children, way more than a hundred children, especially worldwide. Um, so you might see in the news information about a lottery for this gene therapy, trying to figure out how they can um, give out this therapy in a fair way. But pretty cool application of um, using a virus to deliver genetic information. Okay, another use of viruses in biotechnology are called, um, they're called oncolytic viruses. These are tumor targeting viruses that are manipulated in the lab. Um, they target cancer cells. So cancer cells show specific markers. So things on the outside of their cell. And so you can design a virus with a capsid or spikes proteins to target the cancer cell, what we call antigens. So the things on the surface of the cancer cell. And once they get in there, they lyse the cancer cell. So you're killing the cancer, which is great. And by lysing it, you're also releasing cancer antigens which allows the body to form an immune response, such as antibodies and T cells, to additional cancer cells. So it's this really cool kind of bonus. So not only can you destroy these cells like it's showing here, but you can make an immune system that will come in maybe with antibodies or um, cytotoxic T cells and destroy additional cancer cells. Um, there is one that is on the market right now. It's called TVEC and it's for melanoma, which is a skin cancer. It has a gene called GMCSF, which stimulates the immune system. It's based on herpes virus. So it's a modified herpes virus that can actually replicate so we're not doing that. We're not removing disease causing genes. But it can replicate in the cancer cell which destroys it and it's also releasing a stimulating um, protein for immune system. So it's attracting immune cells um, to that melanoma. Um, the treatment involves an injection in the melanoma tumor for every two weeks for about six months or until there's no more um, tumor that they can inject into. Um, it's been fairly successful. It does not work on metastatic melanoma. So the issue with melanoma, the reason you want to get uh, diagnosed, treated quickly with melanoma is it can turn metastatic. And then once it moves throughout your body, very hard to treat. There is another oncolytic virus that's very close to development. It's been in clinical trials. Um, it's called Parv Oryx. This is the company's name. And PARV, parvovirus, um, infects lots of animals, um, especially dogs. This one's from a rat. And it's a very small virus, which allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier. So a lot of viruses cannot. Blood, brain, sorry, 
barrier. Um, so they have been able to use this to target types of brain cancer. So um, glioblastomas. Sorry. Glioblastomas. And some um, neuroblastomas. And what's pretty exciting is they are also targeting pancreatic cancer, which is a very quick moving um, cancer. They're, if you look at their website, they're hoping to hit breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, lymphoma, prostate, renal, tumor stem cells. So they're hoping this is going to um, be a breakthrough in oncolytic viruses. Um, but right now, uh, these are the two cancer um, applications that are in clinical trials. Um, it's non-pathogenic, it doesn't affect normal cells, um, and it's cytotoxic. So it induces cell death um, and stimulates the immune system. So that's oncolytic viruses. Um, another application of viruses in a biotech is bacteriophage therapy. So this is an alternative to antibiotics. So bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. And you probably have seen this classic little guy. Um, they are very specific more specific than antibiotics. They're so specific to the species level. Um, so they have a very narrow host range, which means that you kill off, uh, let's just say less disruption of your natural flora. So you know that we have a lot of good bacteria in our system. Um, and the problem, if you've taken antibiotics, is a lot of times you get an upset stomach, um, you might get a yeast infection, um, or you could get um, a flare-up of C. diff which is a um, bacterial infection that's really hard to treat. It forms spores, um, it's just a pain. And those are all due to loss of your normal flora. So you've got a lot of natural flora that keeps all these other yeast and C. diff and other bugs in check. And when you take a, a spe uh, antibiotic, it kills off a lot of your good gut bacteria. So bacteriophage therapy is much more specific um, and it's much easier to design a new phage than to develop a new antibiotic. So they have seen a little bit of resistance to phage therapy, nothing like they've seen antibiotic resistance. But then they can go in and genetically tweak these phages and um, um, fix the target. So if you start to get, if you have some bacteria immune to one phage, they can tweak it and the bacteria will not be immune to the next one. Um, they say you can de develop new phages in a couple weeks versus a couple years for antibiotics. Um, there's a cool application. Uh, uh, or success story. So this young woman has cystic fibrosis, um, which um, primarily affects the lungs. Um, and she had, um, this was just la uh, in 2019, um, she had a lung transplant and was on immune suppressive drugs, so she went reject the lungs and ended up with a chronic mycobacterium infection that they could not, it was multi-drug resistant um, mycobacteria is a very slow growing bacteria, very hard to treat anyways. And they were able to find a series of phages 
that she could inhale and they killed the bacteria, the mycobacteria, um, and she recovered um, from this chronic infection. Really exciting. Um, so here she is now. You can see previously um, she's a little thinner, um, a little more pale, so she's looking really good. Um, this was a great success story. And one of the cool things um, about this um, phage therapy is that some of the phages that were used that really worked well on um, killing her infection were actually discovered by some undergraduate students. So there's a program, an NSF program called C Phages, where undergraduate um, institutions will go and try to discover new bacteriophages. So they're in everything, in the water, in the soil, all over the environment. And so this um, undergraduate uh, class at um, a university in South Africa had discovered a few phages, had characterized them, and the researchers actually used those to um, treat this young woman. So phage therapy, I think, is pretty exciting. Um, it's been used in other countries for quite a while. It's just now kind of coming to the U.S., um, but the statistics I wrote is that more than 2 million people in the U.S. will develop antibiotic-resistant infections, and over 23,000 of those people will die each year. There's not a lot of um, research going on for new antibiotics. It's just not a big moneymaker. Um, so to be able to have an alternative with phage therapy that seems fairly inexpensive and and you're able to customize and develop ones quickly, I think is um, pretty exciting. All right, the last um, use of viruses that I wanna talk about is, is you know that we have lots of vaccines to different viruses, right? So you inoculate with a live recombinant, or you, you inoculate with a live weakened or, um, uh, blah, 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 what's the word? dead or inactivated virus um, and can create a vaccine to that virus. So you get the, your polio virus vaccine, your measles and mumps vaccine and um, all of those things. Well, viruses are really good at stimulating the immune system. So people have taken advantage of this and engineered the, the virus to produce other genes to make a vaccine against other infectious diseases. Um, one of the really uh, exciting ones right now is an anti-Ebola vaccine. So we're not able to use Ebola itself as the virus um, for a vaccine, but they've been able to make a recombinant. Let me see if it's on here. Um, yeah, um, with vesicular stomatitis virus, so VSV, um, EBOV, Ebola vaccine. Um, so these two charts and these references, if you're interested, just talk about um, some of the different viral vectors for making recombinant vaccines. Um, they're also working on using these viruses to help um, uh, make vaccines against bacterial infections or protozoa infections. So there's an adenovirus um, being used to make an anti-malaria um, vaccine. So this just kind of gives you a little bit of information. Um, the main thing is to look at the immune response. Can you stimulate an immune response? Um, APC are antigen presenting cells. So also help um, the immune response, um, kind of amplify it. So you can see they're using alpha viruses and polio. This was, this was my research that didn't go anywhere, but we were trying to make a, use the polio vaccine to make a dual vaccine. Um, vaccinia, um, different pox viruses, herpes, um, cytomegla, 
adenovirus, measles viruses. Um, and so the idea is stimulate the immune system um, and protect against a second disease. So recombinant virus vectors are using a virus to produce a vaccine to some other um, infectious disease. So just a few applications of uh, viruses and biotechnology. Um, so uh, on their own, viruses aren't so great for us, um, usually cause disease and pathology, but we've been able to harness um, their incredible uh, um, characteristics of specifically targeting cells and delivering genetic information and stimulating the immune system in some very positive ways. All right, thanks.